see you again. Good to see you, Kevin. Okay, well, welcome to another weekly news wrap-up, week ending May 16th. I'm Kevin Lynn. I'm Steve Lamb. And we are the Center for Progressive Urban Politics. We like to discuss things that are international, national, state, and local news. And so, Steve, you know, my concern about the weekly news wrap-up today was so much happened this last week. It's so hard to week, call it. <laughs> yeah, last week we said it was going to be an amazing news week this week, and it turns out we were right. It is. <laughs> well, you know, I thought I'd start out with something national. Uh, Doe's are to snuck... To Sarno. To Sarno. Uh, given death penalty in Boston Marathon bombing. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I thought he would have gotten life, but, you know, they gave him death penalty. Well, it's too bad we gave him the death penalty. You know? why, why is that, Steve? Well, he wants to be a Muslim martyr and hero, and so the death penalty only feeds into that and the idea that he might get his 70 virgins. And we should have made him the girlfriend of 70 dudes in the general population. <laughs> stuck him on a hog farm where he would have been, you know, feeding pigs for the rest of his life, preferably fermented grapes. Now, that may not have been cruel, but certainly unusual. Fitting for the crime. <laughs> okay. Wow. So... Yeah, so off of the, uh, but I'm sure he'll, uh, that will be appealed and we'll have to go. Um, it'll be 10 years, yeah. yeah. And he, he won't be in general population, nobody will bother him, he'll have his own cell. He'll probably be living better than he was living at home with his brother. Yeah. Certainly better than he was living in Chechnya. Yeah. Well, uh, Steve, another uh, story of national prominence uh, back close to my hometown in Philadelphia, an Amtrak train derailed. And Interestingly enough, you know, when I first read the article, and I know that the, the, the lack of investment that we as a country and you see any state in the union and even locally, the lack of investment in infrastructure is significant, particularly when you look at our rail industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would have attributed this to just, you know, a lack of investment and, you know, uh, a, a downward spiral of uh, in our infrastructure, but it doesn't appear to be that way. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. This site, this curve, where where this accident occurred mm -hmm. uh, during World War II in 1943, one of the I think it was the fourth largest rail accident or losses of life in American history occurred. Ninety six people died when the train was only going 56 miles an hour. That was a time when we had uh, high infrastructure investment uh, in the country. Um, but there's another part to the story. That right. The other part is that. It appears that there was some kind of projectile launched at the uh, engineer. Yeah. Well, you know, one of our friends who works for CBS News told us about five years ago that, and I sort of thought he was just kind of like joking, uh, said that a lot of the derailments that are occurring are occurring because of terrorism and they're keeping that fact out of the news. Uh, but this actually goes back into the infrastructure discussion because if you look at European rail, if you look at Asian rail, they're not on 19th century train beds. Right. I mean, when you draw, when you're on a train in the, on the uh, Northeast Corridor, right. I mean, and you go through a tunnel, it's a time warp because that tunnel was built and all the stonework, right. right, it's 19th century. Right. Now, it's a very, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of, job. yeah, not, oh. if we weren't so littered and cluttered with oh. garbage and everything, oh. it's, I, it's almost wax nostalgic, but in that case, it's like, huh, something's just really odd about this. Well, you know, when you look at uh, Japanese, Chinese, Dutch, regional trains, um, it's hard to walk to the rail bed. There is a good 300 feet of various physical barriers on each side. You know, you're right. You from approaching. I recall in Belgium, there's always that berm that's, that right. separates the train from, right. you know, even if it's just a field, there's still a berm in the way. There. Yeah. And we don't have that because we've never made that investment. So it's, e even if there was a projectile, even if there is some kind of terrorism involved, it's still an issue of not making the appropriate mm -hmm. investment to prevent that. Yeah, I, I also love, when we're talking about infrastructure investment, there was an article in the LA Times about these self-driving cars and the accidents that happen are, you know, caused by human error. And I'm thinking to myself, when you look at where we're going in terms of peak oil, 
uh, in the terms of where we really need to be focused on mass transportation. Mm -hmm. and getting us off oil, the fact that we're still playing around with things like smart cars and driverless cars, it just tells me we haven't, as a, a society, woke up to what our future is going to be. Well, you know, the, the car that you don't control is the dream of every urban planner. You know, they're always, they, they've got a real hard on to take human individual control out of the equation. And so their excuse for this is that they can actually stack the cars closer together um, and actually run them at, at a more constant speed in order to increase fuel economy. And of course, a much simpler, if, if we're going to have individual cars, a much simpler lower cost and still more individual and control answer would be to do actually hybrid electric cars, but do them with turbine engines that don't actually run the car, but that run on some really crappy low-grade quality <laughs> fuel, which you can do with a turbine. And the turbine basically generates the electricity for the car. That, you know, and that technology is literally 70 years old, mm -hmm. and we could adopt it tomorrow, but various people won't benefit. True, true. And there is a thing with, you look at urban planning and engineers, you know, just locally. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a press conference last week uh, in Atwater Village, mm -hmm. and they were they're redoing one of the old bridges. Okay. Now it's a four lane road okay. with a sidewalk, and what they're going to do is put in a bicycle a protected bicycle lane, which I'm in Very. favor, but it's almost like not so fast. What they really need to do is a road die. They need a but because what they're going to do is they're going to take away the sidewalk which will force any pedestrian into the protected bike lane. No, no, no. They need to have a protected bike lane and a p protected pedestrian lane, but and as much traffic capacity as they can get because there's not any fewer people coming to California. True, but at the same time, what they really need is just exactly what you said, a protected pedestrian way, a protected bike way, and that might force it down to three lanes. Well, if they keep the same bridge, if they the keep, same road bed. Uh -huh. But um, that's the kicker. They, these engineers are all about pushing. As, it's almost like that you need a fat pipe for all the cars. And there have been a lot of studies that show that if you do the road die, for instance, there in Atwater Village, there's all these local businesses along the road, many of which die after a year. If you were to slow the traffic down a bit, you might in increase the pedestrian shift and increase the bike ridership. You might actually find more people shopping in these areas. I'd like to go with you to Santa Barbara and film State Street. I, I was just there last week and, and talk about these issues because State Street in Santa Barbara is every planner's wet dream. Mm -hmm. There are things about it that work in the ways they say it work. And there are things about it that don't work. And actually, what well, we can get into what makes it work mm -hmm. later when we do that show. But um, it, it's a very interesting thing when you look at the real physical built environment where it's been tried. Gotcha. Okay, uh, next on our agenda, uh, uh, statewide, uh, we're, we're getting we're gearing up for a uh, Senate race here in California. We haven't had a, a real. Uh, we haven't had a. Knock down, drag out, fight in about 16 years. Right, because it's the incumbents kind of running and getting elected again. Uh, we have, you know, the front runner in this for the, on the Democratic Party side seemed to be Kamala Harris, our state attorney general. But then uh, Loretta Sanchez, a, a blue dog Democrat, has thrown her hat into the ring. Yeah, you know, that, that'll make it interesting because once again it'll be the power divides between. Uh, Northern California's power base and Democratic Party and Southern mm -hmm. California's power base trying to beat each other up. Interestingly enough, there's a couple Republicans who no one's ever heard of who are running and they don't even get articles in the Times that say that they've announced when they announced because, I mean, and, and like... Right, it's, guys, uh, it's uh, Assemblyman Rocky Chavez of Oceanside. Got no idea. And former state party chairman Tom Del Basario. You know, he was such a great party chairman that two political hacks like us have got no idea who, who he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, but in a way, it's, it's kind of tragic for California that we're really not given much choice. Well, we have one party rule in California. Right. And we have for a long time. 
the it's a democratic it's a democratic governor. Uh, all the other high statewide offices are Democrat. Uh, it's a assembly, the, state senate, completely controlled right. by Democrats. All the committees are headed by Democrats. It's a, uh, it's boards a, of supervisors controlled by Democrats. Uh, city councils completely controlled by Democrats. Uh, Water committees completely controlled by Democrats or Public Utility Commission. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Right. So I just don't think we're getting that uh, diversity of ideas that we probably should. No, you know, and it's strange. Like, you and I are both very staunch progressives, but, but we disagree on some issues. Um, we, we don't agree with sort of the party narrative. No, not at all. And we have friends who, who are such staunch Democrats, it seems like they've got an embedded chip in the back of their brain. Right. And every morning they get the talking points from Dem Central. And uh, even if they're 180 degrees opposite of what they were yesterday, that's their talking point for today. It's always been true. It's what they've always believed. We, Don't we, show me the email right. from yesterday. Where no, said, no dissonance being, you know, that arises in their mind when they look at something and say, wow, that's actually, in fact, kind of anti-labor. Why are they, but, oh, it's, it's the narrative. It's, yeah, and it's a really strange thing, man. And the party is completely ruled by these people, unfortunately. Which, which kind of brings me to my next topic, Steve. Okay. Um, we've talked about this, <laughs> not only really we've talked about it, we've certainly campaigned about it many times. Uh, there's a new federal effort to deport criminal immigrants However, it's not being supported locally here in L.A. County. You know, uh, let me read this. Uh, in fact, I'll put on my well, glasses. Let's just say this about okay. that first. Our, our supervisor who's retired, Gloria Molina, who was the champion leftist Latina who, who was elected to the Board of Supervisors almost 20 years ago, um, she was on the opposite side of this issue. And, and our new supervisor who replaced her is straight from party side. Right, Hilda Solis. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, the weird thing about Solis is she used to be Obama's Secretary of Labor. Right. And she's for a completely open border, which just kind of makes your head explode. Doesn't understand supply and demand. But this is interesting, Steve. Um, they presented it as a kinder and gentler way for ICE to collaborate with local police, said Los Angeles County Supervisor Sheila Kuehl, who met last week with top Homeland Security officials, ICE Director Sarah Saldana, Saldana and Alejandro Merca, uh, Merca, Mercas, de, uh, Deputy Homeland Security Secretary. I told them it's not kinder or gentler enough. Under the new system, the Priority Enforcement Program, jails will be asked to notify federal authorities when someone will be released, so agents can be waiting. That's what the feds want. Sounds kind of reasonable. So they do their jail time after having done a criminal activity in addition to being here illegally. And then we deport and then they them. get released to federal custody. Beautiful. This time, the agency says, local officials can trust that only people convicted of quote-unquote serious crimes will be targeted. My question to you, Steve, is, how serious a crime do you need to commit in America to not get deported? Um, well, you know, it's strange. Uh, a, a, apparently, you've got to murder someone or okay. cheat on your taxes. Well, no, they all cheat on their taxes. Um, I, <laughs> you know, me, it's, I don't know. I, I, you know you it's so not, ambiguous. Uh, there's no objectivity in this. And so, why be a nation of laws if it all comes down to, wow, your ethnic origin as to how you get treated, what kind of privileges? Because that is, Steve, and I've said this before, it is a privilege when you are not, uh, when you can bend the laws, when you get certain uh, exemptions from the law. Well, you know, certainly if you're not here legally, if you've entered the country illegally, if you've worked under a false social security number, which one assumes you must have, if you've been employed illegally, if you've signed rental agreements illegally, um, on and on and on, and then you get committed of some crime like robbing the grocery store or something, and you get released, uh, I don't understand why you wouldn't expect to be deported. I mean, certainly if you did any of those things in Mexico, after you did your however many number of years in a really awful Mexican jail, 
uh, they would be deporting you. You would not get released back right. into Guadalajara. Right. Um, certainly they would do that in the Netherlands, they would do that in France, they would do that in Canada, they would do that in Australia, Britain, Germany, any country you can think of. But not here. Not here. Because we need a kinder, kinder, more gentle solution. What we really need is wage slaves. And That's what it's about. It, absolutely. Exploitation. Okay, Steve, uh, this is a local story, and, but it gets into, and we've talked about it before, again, back to infrastructure. Uh, in West Hollywood, there was another water main break. 10,000 gallons, you know, gets released. And Nothing. Essentially, it was a 12-inch main rupture around 5 a.m. And, uh, but this is uh, a pandemic in Los Angeles when it comes to our water infrastructure? Well, you know, our, the life expectancy of water supply pipes is somewhere between 40 and 50 years. Right. And that's what the design capacity is. And generally, you know, on something's design capacity, you can cheat it by 15 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. Okay? These pipes, so even with the cheating, 15 to 20 percent, so it's 50, so, you know, you can get, get it to 60. Um, our pipes, most of them were installed in the 1920s. Right. That's 90 years ago. Right. It's interesting because in, uh, in, in an article... Or we're 30 years beyond the cheat date, folks. Right. Uh, even DWP, uh, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, said 6% of the system earned grades of D and F. Now. More than 40% of the pipes created D and F were installed 1930 or earlier. Uh, so there you go. But 1930, the fact is, a lot, some of these pipes are from the 1890s. Well, my, my water company in Altadena, um, <laughs> when they installed their main line going out of the Lard Canyon in 1906, they used, yeah, they used antique pipe that was riveted that they had stopped making in 1890. So they bought it somewhere circular. So they were wrapping metal, metal around metal. They too. wrapped metal around metal and riveted it. Um, and so, so they stopped making this stuff in 1890. So when they bought it, it was 16 years old and antiquated. Uh, and they replaced it four years ago and they found that it was leaking as much water as it was delivering. So for every gallon of water getting to the destination, a gallon got siphoned right. off somewhere in the so, but you know, it they ran it for a hundred and uh, hundred and seven years, and you know it had a, a design life of forty years. Yeah, and if we don't, uh, you know, find ways to restrict our water consumption by twenty percent, we're faced with fines here in Los Angeles. Well, yeah, and that's a bit dicey because they found like when they had days when you couldn't water mm -hmm. on certain sections of town, you know, you fill the water on these days, you know, water those days. They found that the pipes would actually burst from having too much pressure. <laughs> so it was actually <laughs> causing an even bigger problem to, to have water restrictions. So it's, it's yeah, issue. but this is a significant problem and it's a it's probably a one point five billion dollar problem to correct at that's, this point. That's not even real money when you're talking about wars in Iraq. Sure. I mean, that's, that's a one point trillion, point yeah, five trillion. It's, it's a bomber, or, or it's, a, it's, a failed, mm -hmm. it's a failed fighter that no one's ever going to do. It's a portion of the design budget. But it's a problem fight. in L.A., and I'm sure most cities in America oh, see New York. This. I mean, New York's got stuff that's even older than ours. Chicago, Dallas. I mean, just the, you know, a few weeks ago we were talking about how our town council voted to spend a billion dollars to repair our sidewalks. Now they're going to spend the billion dollars over a 65 year period. They ever walk down a sidewalk in Los Angeles, you know what terrible condition they're in. It's, it's all this deferred maintenance that's been going on for decades and it's all catching up to us. Yeah, we've been doing deferred maintenance since Proposition 13, uh, but the size of the government payroll and the number of people on the government payroll has increased geometrically. The only thing is, is that the services aren't being provided to the people. There you go. Speaking of getting served. Oh! <laughs> okay, brings us to our next article. Uh, uh, it would appear that uh, former undersheriff Paul Tanaka, uh, once the agency's second highest ranking figure 
and now retired Captain William Tom Carey are charged with conspiracy and obstruction of justice for allegedly concealing the whereabouts of an inmate who was working as an FBI informant. Well, let's talk for a second about what that FBI informant was informing about. It was obviously it, the condition of the jails, correct? There have been allegations in Los Angeles County for, well, since before I was born, actually, um, that the county sheriffs were beating inmates, that they were baiting inmates into fights, that they were actually baiting inmates into fights and then betting on them, that they were acting as gangs. And this behavior has gotten worse over time. In fact, it got to the point where sheriffs, you know, the sheriff was actually like having luncheons for people, like Christmas parties and stuff. And the people in the jails on various floors would literally start fighting each other in public over which basically gangs upset of the sheriffs was the biggest and the baddest. So he actually had to stop having those events. Um, so the FBI had a guy planted in there to inform on this, and he had a cell phone, and they found his cell phone. You're not allowed to have a cell phone in the jail. Mm -hmm. So they took his cell phone from him. They very quickly discovered that he was an FBI undercover agent. And rather than just like handing him over uh, and, and giving the FBI the phone, they transferred this guy all around their jail system under various different names and hid him from the FBI, which of course is obstruction of justice. <laughs> Could also be considered kidnapping in a way. Kidnapping in a way. And here's the really wild thing. Carrie, the captain in this case, right. he's the guy who's in charge of what's the equivalent of their internal affairs division. So he, he should be the honest broker in all this. He's supposed to be the moral compass for the <laughs> department. He's supposed to be the guy who's like the law, the law, the law, the book, the book, the book. And instead, he's involved in the conspiracy to obstruct justice. And, you know, Tanaka... Tanaka's been a known problem for a, at least a decade. He's part of this thing called the Vikings, mm -hmm. which was a white and Asian gang within the sheriffs that were anti-black and Latino. Um, so, you know, T Tanaka's been a horrific problem. Uh, he gets appointed by Leroy Baca to be the undersheriff after he's known to be a problem. Well, it's interesting you bring up uh, Baca because ah. uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago, he announces that he is uh, going to run for re-election. And three days later he announces he's, he's going to retire. Well, a, a lot of us, I'm not the only one, I have friends who are inside LA County government who believe that Mr. Baca made a deal whereby the feds wouldn't go after him for these acts. They would let him go if he would just resign and go away. And it pretty much looks like that's happened because he's at the top of the pyramid of the conspiracy and nobody's indicting him and everyone's testified that so Leroy ran the whole thing. So what do you think will happen to Tanaka? Nothing. Nothing? No, no, no. Uh, Perry's gonna go away. He'll, he'll go get some minimum one, two year jail time. But I mean, look, Tanaka, there's no photograph of him in a horror. There's no photograph of him doing a perp walk. Uh, when he yeah, I noticed that in the news. He's in a suit and he's smiling, walking away by himself. Um, and you know, when he was in federal court, the judge, they brought him in in handcuffs. The judge immediately ordered him released from his handcuffs. They don't do that to, you know, normal citizens who are in front of the bar in, in federal court. So he's already getting special treatment. He's already getting good treatment from the system. They're gonna cut him loose. He's, you know, he's he's an important person. They won't punish him because, well, you know, the entire system's corrupt. Uh, sad testimony. Well, our next story is also uh, local to LA City and LA County. Uh, homelessness up twelve percent. Well, that's really funny, because Pasadena just released a study that said homelessness was down in Pasadena. Even though mm. if you're a Pasadena citizen, you're walking around you can tell that homelessness is up. But it turns out that certain not-for-profits who also funded the study oh, okay. are getting paid bonus amounts of money if they claim, or I mean, if that they they're actually show effectively dealing with homelessness. they're effectively dealing with homelessness and homelessness is going down. But clearly, if you're walking the streets uh, in LA or in Pasadena or in Altadena or San Gabriel or anywhere else in Southern California, uh, you know homelessness is up it's up by a lot, it's up by an amount you can feel. Gotcha. And, you know, for me, uh, 
it's the, the article is like, oh, a shock. We've been doing all this work and putting in millions to uh, bring down homelessness. And to me, it's a joke because, you know, it started in the 1990s with, the, with, uh, with NAFTA, GATT, WTO, and began to outsource all these decent middle class manufacturing jobs. And then in the, and before then in the 80s, when we really just opened up the borders. So now we've outsourced and then we've insourced what, in terms of jobs what we couldn't outsource. Uh, and you wonder why there's homelessness. And add to that, that you know, people of our generation are starting to retire, we're spending less, it's constricting the economy. I mean, all these forces are coming together and creating situations like this. Well, yeah, you know, when you export your manufacturing, and we like took entire factories and exported them out of the country. Mm -hmm. When you import endless free labor, or more or less free, I mean, when you uh, have a regulatory environment that encourages people to not illegally work and do other things, mm -hmm. Uh, you end up with a situation where, where people really can't work and attain enough money to pay rent. I mean, look at what rent is in L.A. now. I mean, my God. Uh, I have a friend who rents a room with a bathroom down the hall in some lady's house, and it's $700 a month, and he feels like he's getting a deal. He figures it should be another $150 higher than that. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just insane. You know, how do you make enough money to to afford rent, a car, car insurance, health insurance, food, uh, in this economy where wages are not only less than stagnant, in real terms they're declining. And, and we're seeing down. the the result, and that is increased homelessness everywhere you look. Everywhere. <clears throat> okay, and. Um, Finally, on a local level, going back to Pasadena. Oh, I love uh, this one. And this, this uh, report did pick up some national attention. It, it appears that Pasadena leaders received thousands in Rose Bowl tickets. Pasadena city leaders received thousands of dollars worth of free tickets to the Rose Bowl in 2014, according to the yeah. Times analysts. Well, you know, and they, they don't exactly know what those tickets were worth, but it's somewhere around 150 thousand dollars. Hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. There's seven members who, who are on the And that's just for two thousand fourteen. Well <laughs> yes. You know, this this scandal keeps reappearing about once every ten years, all of a sudden everybody realizes that these people are getting all these free tickets. They're not reporting it as income. Mm -hmm. They're claiming that they're giving people the free tickets in order to influence them bringing their business to Pasadena or some crap like that. But then uh, really, there should be a record. I mean, you would think there'd be a record. You'd think that there would be a record. Or you would think if this was an honest system that was not a system of corruption and graft, that they would discuss in public, okay, we want this business to come here, and we want to give this guy, you know, and his wife and his kids, you know, X number of tickets to these events to influence them to like Pasadena. Well, there's no accounting of who got the tickets? I mean, you know, several of the council people said, well, I went to one or two events and I gave away the rest of the tickets. But they're not saying, well, I gave away the tickets to, you know, the chairman of this company and that company. No. And, you know, they can't do that. You know why they can't do that? Because they gave away the tickets to their campaign donors. And because this stuff is income. And it's unreported income. And it's part of a system of graft and corruption that goes back at the Rose Bowl. Well, first of all, the Rose Bowl itself was built as a theft. Really? What's the story there? Oh, funny story. 1914, the citizens of Pasadena passed this ballot initiative to tax themselves on their water mm -hmm. um, to build recreational facilities throughout the Arroyo Seco. And they're going right. to build archery ranges and campgrounds and special, like, trout lakes and, and equestrian centers and all this kind of wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. And they built a couple of small things, and then they took all that money and built the Rose Bowl. Uh, so they built a sports stadium in the bottom of a floodplain, and never finished building the the rest of the amenities that they were going to build for the citizens. So 
the very even spread. then, even then, you had these right. these right. white elephant uh, right. sports uh, right. uh, monstrosities. Oh, and this was the first one, and I mean, it's it's a monument to the bait and switch technique of government. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they've spent over the last 30 years, they've spent a third of a billion dollars retrofitting that damn thing. And their excuse is, well, we spent so much money in you know, making it earthquake safe. Oh, and building all those boxes for the 1%. Yes, right. Because that's how you make the money. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then they built like huge areas of sky boxes now. Well, we spent so much money doing that. Uh, that we got to have tons and tons and tons of events. Now they're going to talk about having a three-day Coachella event at the Rose Bowl. So as someone who lives close to Pasadena and does have to, if you're going to come downtown or go east or go west, what's that going to do to traffic if you have a three-day well, event? Well, let me tell you, when they had the Jay-Z Beyonce concert there, mm -hmm. one of those days I was coming back from here where you live in L.A. and from where the 2 joins the 210, to my house, six blocks above Pasadena and Altadena, it took three hours to get home. Three hours. And you know, I have a suspicion that there were a lot of tickets that were given to CHP officials and LA County officials. Not a word about that. I mean, they choked the freeway. You couldn't get out of Eagle Rock. Eagle Rock was completely shut down. Altadena was completely shut down. West Pasadena was completely shut down. The freeways were shut down in, in a non-moving clot for miles. And officialdom has not a word to say. So Ooh. I think aside from these uh, tickets that were given to some city council people, there was a whole lot more graft and gravy going on. Yeah, because you want to be in one of those skyboxes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, uh, boy, uh, We've certainly gone longer than we usually plan to, but there was so much news to cover this week. And hopefully next week will be exciting, too. All right. Well, Steve, again, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for joining us. Uh, please join us next week for another weekly news wrap-up. And uh, from the Center for Progressive Politics, have a great week, and see you next week.